Yeah, that that actually it, it's kind of I'm impressed. That that was good because like cause I was kind of having this this sort of image of you sort of saying objects and then sort of looking at that thing and being like, I'm sure I saw that symbol at school somewhere once, but yeah. I just googled set operators. You just googled set operators before you. Well done, well done. Yeah, that that's creative. Um, Yes, that, that is the intersection symbol. And uh, what I actually want to do in this session is talk a little bit about uh, what happens when we uh, look at the, the space where concurrency and objects intersect. Um, well, we'll get there. Hi, I'm Jonathan, by the way. Uh, I do some of the work on concurrency stuff in Pulse X. Okay, so uh, that's, that's why I'm talking about this stuff. Oh, and the photo? Where's the photo? China, Hong Kong, yeah, yeah. I was uh, I was sent over to that part of the world for a work assignment last year, and uh, went up on the hill on a pretty night and took the photo. And it's uh, it has some lights. Okay. Anyway. Oh, and, and that's it. that one is me in Norway, south on the edge of Prekestolen, um, and uh, I showed this to uh, uh, my now fiance, and she was she was like, "You're crazy to sit there," and I and I'm like, "Oh, come on, it's only 800 meters." What could possibly go wrong? Yeah. As long as only one of the Pel6 core folks sits on the edge of the time, it's okay. Yeah. It's, I guess it's fjord number rather than bus number, right? Okay. So, uh, concurrency. Um, so, a, l a while ago, um, you know, I was, um, I've been working on the, the Pel6 effort for a while, and we kind of got to this point where I said, well, um, we really, really, really need to start getting a lot more concrete about what we're doing with the concurrency stuff because there's a lot of ideas uh, there's a lot of you know it should work like this but um, there hadn't been enough implementation progress and I was like this is something that I need to work on and even if it's not a final polished implementation this needs to happen so that we can have the back and forth on all of the API things and all of the you know the language design things and you know, if we've learned anything in Perl 6, it's that you never nail that first time. Some things you go around a few times on. Um, so I wanted to get that ball rolling. And uh, where I started, because um, there's you know there's, there's there's concurrency, there's asynchrony, there's parallelism. They're all kind of different, you know. I mean, uh, async is you know I say well go off and do that thing, um, and I don't care about the result yet. Uh, and later on, you know, we we get told, oh, here's a result. Um, it's it's asynchronous. We're not sat waiting around. Okay, stuff just just happens later. Um, but then concurrence and parallel are different as well. I mean, in parallel, it's all about taking a task that we could do serially and saying, let's distribute it over, uh, say, multiple cores. Uh, and uh, parallelism is what lets us take advantage of these these multi-core CPUs that we have. Um, now, the nice thing about parallelism is that it doesn't bring in non-determinacy, okay? Um, with parallelism, what you're doing is you're taking a problem that you could solve serially, serially that's a hard word, and uh, saying, well, let's break it into pieces we can spread over the multiple cores, but we know that the answer should always come out the same. Um, and then you have concurrency, um, where actually it is non-deterministic where you have all kinds of interesting interleavings. Um, it's the sort of classic thing where you go and you, uh, you, know, you, you uh, have the autocomplete box on Google and you start typing something in and you pause for a bit and they send off the request to the server, okay? And uh, you're sort of uh, sat around thinking about what you want to search for and you type a bit more and it sends another request off to get those autocomplete suggestions, the ones people like trying to make funny poems out of. Um, and, uh, you know, the second time you uh, hit the server, the request comes back and it beats the first one. Okay, maybe you hit some good cache or something like that, uh, and then you have the you know the fact that you have to deal with that. You have to make sure you don't overwrite that update up to date information with the uh, the out of date information. Um, this is just typical of what happens in concurrency. Okay, there's all of these non deterministic things, and it's very hard to even answer what correct means. So. When I started looking at uh, at this, um, you know, there's a lot of ways to try and bring some sanity to dealing with parallel and concurrent and asynchronous problems. Um, and uh, you know, one of those approaches is to look at a more functional approach. 
And uh, that's kind of where we started in. Um, and uh, you know, what is functional? It's really about focusing on computations that produce results rather than thinking about having state. Um, so you know, the, we sort of have this this sort of thing that uh, you know the the really painful thing that causes a lot of the problems is shared state uh, with concurrency. Well, uh, if you avoid the state, that's the functional approach, and we are really talking about avoiding the shared. So. Let's just look at a couple of small examples of, of what uh, sorts of things we can do. So uh, here, um, we can go and uh, create a proc async. OK, we'll run trace route. Um, we then will uh, start the process, and we get back an object called a promise. And this promise is something that represents the ongoing execution of that process. And we can go off, and we could do other things Okay, in the meantime. And later on, we can await that promise, and uh, that means you know wait for it to get done, and we will uh, we'll get back some kind of object representing the exit code. Um, so this promise mechanism represents something uh, that will complete in the future, and you know a promise can be backed by pretty much anything, including other promises. So what I can do is I can write something like this. I can say, well, what we will do is we will uh, sort of st start off this process, OK? And uh, that proc.start gets me a, a promise representing the completion of the trace route. But what I will do then is I'll say, I want to wait for any of the trace route being done or 10 seconds having elapsed. And whichever one of those happens first, OK, I'll end up here, and then I'll just say, oh, kill the process unless the process already got done. So we, be, we are able to already here um, compose under one common primitive programming with time and programming of processes, okay? which is uh, a lot of what we tried to do in Perl 6. We try and make it so you can take different kinds of thing and have a common paradigm for them. Now. Promises, you know, they're pretty great for things that produce just, uh, you know, a result. But of course, when we're programming, we don't just have scalars. We have arrays. Now, what you also have then in the asynchronous world is things that will produce a value asynchronously in the future. And you have, uh, you know, things that will produce many values over time. Um, and, uh, you know, Trivial example, but uh, what I can do here is I can make a supply. This is a thing that supplies asynchronous values over time. And it's a supply that will sort of give a tick every second. Now, when you have a list okay, in Perl 6, we actually can do uh, lazy lists, which means lists can be infinitely long. So I can have the list of all prime numbers ever. okay. And you might say, is, is that a hard thing to do? And the, the actual answer is that. Uh, that one is, uh, yeah, so I can uh, take the numbers from 1 up to infinity, OK? And I can grep out all those that uh, is prime, OK? And uh, as long as I, you know, if I, if I uh, just say, um, you know, what is the, the first? What have I done? Primies. Oh, wow. Thank you. Primies. Sounds so cute. Yes. OK. And uh, now I can go for, uh, actually, let's get all of them up to five, the first five, OK? Or the first hundred, um, the first thousand, OK? And uh, OK. And uh, what you'll notice there is it's sort of doing them on demand, OK? and. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that means we can have these infinitely long things. Now, uh, of course, um, you could start mapping these as well uh, and grepping them and doing all the normal list things on them. Well, what we've done with asynchronous uh, data is said, well, you should be able to do exactly the same. So what I can do here is I can take time, OK, a tick every second, and I can map it. And I can map it into uh, what, what, what I actually get is an uh, incrementing number. Okay? So every second, it throws 
a, a zero, then a one, then a two, then a three. And what I'll do is I'll just map them. I'll say, does the number two divide into it? And depending whether it does or not, we'll say tick or tock. OK, uh, we tap it. That means that I want to start the flow of values. And I want to have, in this case, this bit of code called with them. And I've just passed the say function there, which just uh, says things. And that will just print tick, tock, tick, tock. And it will do it on a different thread. So if I don't do anything, that program will terminate immediately. So we'll just sleep for 10 seconds to see them. OK, so uh, of course, that's a. Uh, a trivial example, but let me just show you some of the things that we can uh, build out of that, okay, with this, this more functional approach. Um, so uh, this is a, a little code golf assistant, okay? We all love playing code golf in Perl 6. Uh, I've probably shown this one to some of you before, but let me just show you this cute little, little app. And uh, it's not the biggest thing, is it? But anyway, uh, what we have here is... Uh, the number of characters I've typed, okay, and my golf, the number of seconds I've wasted doing this, and uh, you know, if I if I just sort of uh, you know was to put in one plus two, it immediately evaluates that down there and says it's uh, it's free, okay, and uh, I can put in you know a string and substring it, okay, and uh, yeah, okay, there's there's no slaughter without laughter. Um, and uh, so all this whole program is actually uh, it's evaluating that code off on a background thread. I've got time going on. And there's, there's actually something a bit subtle, because you might have noticed that, uh, you know, suppose that I, um, you know, I'm typing this. Of course, it's not valid code while I'm typing it. And indeed, if I uh, just knock that off, OK, I get the error there. Um, but what it's actually doing is that it's not actually evaluating the code. Uh, until I've sort of left things alone for a while. Okay, so there's time involved in this as well. So we've got all of this stuff with time, with background threads running the code, uh, with UI events. And of course, if you're building a user interface, you have to do all of the interactions and updating the user interface on the correct thread as well. Otherwise, you're just in very big trouble. Um, but at the same time, the result okay, from evaluating the code is going to be done on a background thread. And ag, 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 that's horrible. Um, but it's actually not too horrible in Perl 6. So let's just uh, show you the, um, the about 20 lines of code that this program uh, takes to write. Okay. So this is the really boring bit. Um, we go and we create uh, a, uh, a simple little application, a one-window app. And we just sort of say, well, in there, there's going to be uh, a, ver a vertical box to lay things out. We'll have the, uh, the, the text view where the code is being typed. We'll uh, have uh, a label, which has the number of characters. We'll have the amount of time elapsed, which starts as an empty label. And we'll have a text view for the result. And I've just assigned all of these uh, as we, uh, we went through there. So UI events uh, in this module are exposed as supplies because they're an asynchronous stream of values. Okay? And what I can do is I can just say, well, what I want to do every time the source code in that text view is changed, then I want to tap it, and I want to run this piece of code. Okay? And what we will do is we'll just uh, update the text in that uh, chars label saying uh, we've got that many characters now. OK, so that's, that's just a sort of cute -ish way to write a little, little event handler. So not, not so exciting so far. But uh, here's another thing we can do. Remember supply.interval that gives the, uh, the tick every second? OK, we take one of those. Now, again, we can just tap it, but we have to be a tiny bit careful here. Because that interval thing is running off on some thread. OK, but what we can do is we can actually say, oh, by the way, I want you to take this and schedule it on the GTK simple scheduler. Um, which is something that just makes sure that piece of code runs in the idle cycles of the, uh, the event loop of the UI. Okay? So uh, that's, uh, uh, we, we have this general notion of scheduling. Um, and this is a way of saying schedule it on that particular thread. Now, the other thing about supplies is they can spew values out in lots of different directions. So we can actually subscribe a second thing that is interested in when we change the source code. And this time, I'm going to say that the value has to be stable for one second. 
Okay, so that there just gives me a way of saying I don't want you to actually push values onwards until one second has elapsed without the value changing. That is how I got my text box to, uh, you know, to not actually end up with the code being compiled uh, until after one second of, of not doing any work. And you'll notice that's a fairly tricky uh, thing to implement in general, but we've got a paradigm where we can factor those things out. And then we say I want to start running some code, and that actually runs it off over on a, uh, a background uh, thread. And uh, this is a little bit of a curious thing, because what it gives me is, you know, I have a supply of values here, of source code, okay? And this is, at this point, a supply of source code that hasn't changed for a second, so we should try running it. But what does start give me? Well, it actually gives me a supply of supplies, okay? That is an, an asynchronous stream of asynchronous streams. Why? Well, because we actually have a little bit of a problem like the Google one I told you about before, okay? Remember how I said that when you put something in that text box and we go off to Google to get the autocomplete suggestions and then we put something else in, we should never let the thing from before beat the thing that came later, okay? We, uh, we need to make sure in our case that if we do an eval and it takes a long time and then we change the code and it evals very quickly, that we don't go and uh, show the, you know, the ancient uh, result over the top of the, the correct one. Um, so uh, what we use is migrate, okay, which means here I have a set of things that produce asynchronous values. Um, go and always pay attention to the latest one. And there's, there's all kinds of cases where you might want to do that. Um, you know, if you, you sort of have a, you know, a bunch of uh, you know stock prices coming through, um, and you have different places that you can uh, that you might be be interested in, and the user flips to a different uh, stock they want to watch the prices on. Okay, your source of data has just changed, and uh, you now want to pay attention to the new one. So, finally, we say okay, schedule it over on the uh, the UI because we've ran code on the background thread. Okay, we had time stuff going on, um, and then. Uh, just go and put the results uh, of running the code into that uh, that text box. Okay, so that's it. Okay, that's all the code for that little little application. It's uh, it's it's a little dense, but the thing about this is that we get rid of all of the the issues uh, about um, shared state and shared mutable state by basically factoring it out of the code um, and you know getting the synchronization into all of these primitives, which is quite a win. But different problems need different approaches. And there are kinds of problem where this approach gets difficult. Because when you look at the problem you have, you say, my problem really is the sort of problem where I do have state. And the convenient expression of the problem is a collaboration over the state, okay? Where people are coming along and saying, I want to do this thing. Can I? I, know I want to do this thing. And we want to synchronize those various operations over it. And, uh, you know, when we're looking at eventy problems and asynchronity problems and time problems, very often this sort of functional approach works very well. Um, and you know we've we've got some really nice stuff in Pulsex that, and I said okay, um, but I know from building a lot of you know systems in the wild that do parallel and concurrent and async things, um, some problems just do not. Uh, you know, have a neat fitting solution uh, in this case. And even if you can find the way. Um, you know, that doesn't mean that because you can get your problem into a certain shape, that's the elegant way to do it. So, if we have sort of said that, you know, one of the reasons we look to this more functional style is because it sort of gets, uh, you know, the state out of things, and we know that objects are very staty, you know, where does this leave OO in the concurrency landscape? Um, and, you know, uh, does this mean that objects and concurrency are uh, a bad mix in some way? And uh, the answer is you know, not really. Um, but uh, to actually see how objects and concurrency can go really well together, 
um, we need to just take a step back and think a little bit about what objects actually are. One of the, uh, the things um, about objects and about object orientation is that we tend to focus a bit too much in general on the objects themselves. What object orientation maybe should have been called is message orientation. And this isn't my view. This is the view of the guy who co coined the term object orientation. Okay, Alan Kay kind of said, you know, many years on, I kind of wish I hadn't called it object orientation because it makes people focus on the wrong thing, the objects. Now, the reason people focus on the objects is because, of course, if we have a procedural programming upbringing, which many of us do, me included, it's very comfortable because you're used to writing code which operates on data. So then when you think about objects as things with data and then code inside of them that operate on that data, it feels all very comfortable. But if we want to use objects successfully, and especially if we want to use objects in a concurrent setting and actually you know, get things working well, um, we need to, to really think a bit about the messaging view of it all. When I'm doing object-oriented design, the first thing that I design or the first thing I identify is not my classes, it's my methods. And I look at the invariance, the business rules that need to be upheld on those methods, and only from those do I let myself discover the classes that I'll need. The classes are a distinct second thing for me in object-oriented design. They're the thing I get after my methods. Now, why does this matter? It matters because a good object is something that bounds the state. Good objects protect the state on the inside, and we only manage to achieve this if we succeed in getting those object boundaries in the right place. Once we do that, Okay, we're able to put the methods on the correct objects and we can get to a place where we really don't need to go and ask objects very much about what they know. That also, though, means that method calls in this model become a natural point of concurrency control. Because they're the boundary at which we give an object something to do and it's got its state inside of it, which is the thing that we want to get control over, Okay, and uh, if the method calls uh, are seen as messages going off to that object, that means that's, a, that's sort of a point where we can enforce some control uh, over the, uh, the concurrency and the operations on the state in that object. Now, this of course means that we need to you know, start thinking a little bit differently about objects um, than the many uh, things that I see out in the wild. Um, so, you know, avoid getters, damn it. Um, you know, a lot of the um, the thing that I you know I see um, in object systems in the enterprise is a bunch of classes that are called something service, and a bunch of objects which are basically a load of properties, and the service code f uh, fiddles with those objects. But if we want to do concurrent objects really well, we we can't do this. Every time we return state from inside of our object, there's two distinct dangers. One is that if we return something mutable, it can be changed from outside of our object. If our object is going to be serving as a concurrency boundary, that's a complete disaster because we've just lost control over it. But we also risk, lo risk, ah, risk logic leaks when we have uh, immutable things that are getting returned as well. The other thing to understand about methods when you come and do concurrent things, though, is we need to start viewing methods as little transactions that take objects from one consistent state to another and that uphold the invariance on those objects. So when you come and implement a concurrent operation, we, you know, we actually find that we, we need to make the methods be things that you know, get an entire thing done. Um, and when you look at concurrent um, data structures, 
it's very striking that lots and lots of design patterns that normally exist around the use of the data structures have to move inside of them. Let me give you a very concrete example. Um, if you have a queue, a very common operation on a queue is dequeue something. And a very common pattern is to say, if the queue contains something, okay, so if, if queue.lms, for example, is greater than zero, then dequeue an item from the queue. Now, as soon as that becomes a concurrent thing, every method has to stand alone as a sensible transaction, meaning that if you go and ask, how many elements do you have? And then the next thing, you, uh, you, you get an answer back, okay? And then you decide, okay, let's dequeue one. If the object is the point of concurrency control, the answer could change between those two points. Which is why if you go and look at any language that has a concurrent queue class, it doesn't really have a dequeue method necessarily. It has a try and dequeue method, where we put the check and the dequeue inside of the object so it can do the concurrency control over the whole composite operation. And you need to do this for all of the things when you go and start doing concurrent objects. The alternative, of course, is that you start saying, well, we'll take a lock on the object first. That's really a great path to getting lots of problems like deadlock, okay? Because then you end up with ad hoc locking all over the place. The real way to get this is to have object graphs that basically look tree-like, not directed acyclic graph-like. And when your object graph looks like a tree and you're always locking down the tree, okay, you can't get deadlock then because the, the object graph doesn't actually have any cycles. So what I want to do um, in this, uh, the rest of the time I have is to show you three approaches that we might adopt if we're going to try and uh, put objects into a concurrent setting. And uh, all three are, it's not really a competition between them, it's more that they, ha stre they have strengths and weaknesses in different situations. The first one I talk want to talk about is monitors. A monitor looks just like a class, but it provides what we call mutual exclusion on the methods. What this means is if you call a method on it, then only one thread is going to be able to be running a method at a time and everyone else will have to queue up and wait their turn. Now, recursion is okay. What I mean by that is if you call a method on a monitor and in, in the process of it doing its work, it calls another method on the same object, that's okay. Okay, so that kind of uh, recursion inside of the object is all right. But if two different threads come along, okay, and uh, one of them calls, you know, foo, and the other one calls bar, and foo is running, this thread has to wait. Okay, it blocks, it waits, it gets to here, and then it says, okay, I can have my turn. What this means for the state of the object is that you know that only one thread can ever be touching and working with that state at a time, which is a relatively you know, straightforward model. Perl 6 has fairly extensible syntax. One of the things you might have seen is that we have things like a class keyword and a grammar keyword and a role keyword Okay, for these different kinds of package or module. But that's something you can extend. So I wrote a module called OO monitors, okay, that gives you a monitor keyword. The only thing you have to do to write a monitor compared to a class is use the module and put the word monitor there instead of class. And then you go and write your state, which you know only one thread is going to be able to touch at a time. So here we have a little IP filter, okay, and we, uh, we have a, a blacklist, we have active requests, we have a limit of requests uh, that uh, any one IP can make, and we, uh, we have things that we've blocked. 
And here we, uh, you know, we have a way to add things into that blacklist. Okay, we have a way to remove things from the blacklist. And then we can uh, write a, a method saying, should we start the request for this IP? Okay, and it will take a look and it will say, well, if the blacklist contains the IP or the number of active addresses for this IP address has hit the limit, then we'll increment the number of requests we blocked and we'll return false. Otherwise, we'll increase the number of requests we're processing for this IP address and we'll return true. And then at the end, we'll just go and decrement that. And even if we have lots and lots of threads processing web requests, Okay, we can be safe in the knowledge this state is not going to get corrupted. So if I simulate four request threads, okay, so I, uh, I make my class, I make a bunch of IP addresses, okay, and uh, then I just uh, pick IPs at random and uh, do a start and end, okay, um, within that space, uh, then at the end it will come back and it will tell me, oh, I blocked a bunch of... Uh, of addresses. In fact, I have that one not there. Something like here. Okay, and it's it's random, so after a while it'll it comes back and it tells me it's blocked various numbers of, of requests. Now, you might say, you know, where where does the concurrency control happen? Okay, because I'm just writing a methods in my monitor. And the answer is that when you actually view a method call as sending a message. When you send a message, then it can be routed in various ways. So if I, you know, I send something off to, you know, another country uh, in the post, then of course, you know, customs may get it and they may look at it and then they'll pass it on. But you get to sort of do interesting things with it rather than just saying, oh, it's like calling a piece of code and that's it. Okay, you actually can step in the middle and say, we're going to do something more interesting when we process this message. And all the monitor keyword does in from OO monitors is it actually uses an implementation of classes where when you receive an incoming message, it enforces the mutual exclusion. Okay, So you don't have to go and put a load of uh, things on your class where you lock. You don't even see the lock. Okay, It's there, but you don't see it. Instead, that's all being handled behind the scenes by processing the messages in a different way. By saying, okay, you called a method, what we'll do is we will process that in a bit of a, a, a different kind of manner. Okay? Now, that sorts out certain kinds of problem. There's other kinds of problem um, where you are uh, inside one of these uh, these classes, and you kind of realize that you can't make progress until something else takes some kind of action. And you want to efficiently wait. So what you want to do is give up your, your lock, okay, your exclusion, and sort of say, some other thread can have a go. I'm at a point where it's safe for them to do that. And I want to wait until they say a certain condition has been met. And because this is a, uh, an operating system scheduler supported mechanism, um, this is actually a very, very efficient way to, to wait. And uh, this is something that, that all the, the operating systems provide. So let's think a little bit about an example. Suppose I have a queue. Okay, I want to build myself a little queuing mechanism. And I want to limit how long the queue can be. And you can't put yourself into the queue if it's longer than a certain length. If, that, if it's longer than a certain length, you have to wait. Okay, this is a way of providing something we call back pressure, where we, you know, we're, we're sort of having, a, say, a producer-consumer model where one thread is producing lots of stuff, another is using lots of stuff. And we say, wait a minute, we don't actually want to let this queue get millions of items long. Okay, because it'll fill memory. What we need to do is push back a bit on the producer so they slow down. And we need to tell them to wait if the queue is, uh, is full. So how can I implement something like this? 
Well, what I can say in here is that I, I want to have a, a monitor, again, which is a priority queue. And I can say, but I want to condition this on two things. The property is not full and not empty. Okay. And again, this is not syntax that is in the core of Perl 6. This is something that we implement in this OO monitors library. And then we'll have a limit. Okay, so when you set the queue up, you have to provide a limit. And we have a set of tasks that are in the queue. And here's what we do when we want to add a task into the queue. We say, while the number of things in the queue is at the limit, wait for the condition not full to be met. Okay? And then, when it has been met, Okay, we come down here and we put our task in, and then we say, by the way, if anybody else is waiting for the condition that the list the uh, list of tasks is not empty, we've met that condition. Okay, so we say meet condition there. So you can see that what I have is I, I came in here, you know, I'm inside of the method in the monitor, I've got the lock, I'm safe, and then I go in here, I say, okay, I'm going to wait for there to be something there. Uh, sorry for it to be not full, okay, if it already is. And I give up the lock there. So some other thread can come in and put something in the queue, okay, and then it will, uh, uh, or take something from the queue, okay, and eventually uh, someone will have taken something, we'll come back in, we'll have the lock again, okay, we'll go around the loop, we'll check again, and then we'll say, okay, put our task in and meet the not empty. And uh, the take task is symmetrical. It looks just the same. What we do here is we uh, say, well, I want to wait for the condition not empty because uh, you know if there's nothing in the queue, I can't take anything. And then at the point that we fall out of here, we want to meet the condition um, not full. And then we will just hand back a task. Okay. So. Monitors are, are kind of flexible in that way. They, they provide us this conditioning. Um, they're a relatively simple programming model. If you have a well-designed class that follows the various rules of, you know, of encapsulation that, uh, that really has transactional methods, going from a well-designed class to a monitor is not a big step. Okay? Um, in fact, in, uh, you know, in, in terms of the actual code change, it's use a module and then change the word class into monitor and you're done. Of course, there's downsides. You're sat in a queue waiting, which means that monitors can cause threads to block. Now, there's also a bit of vulnerability, vulnerability to deadlock. Okay, that is, that happens where, you know, one thread has got uh, two locks and the other thread is, uh, no, say, let's do that again. Two threads are, qu are trying to acquire two locks and they try and take them in the opposite order. Okay, uh, so the first one gets one lock, the other one gets the other lock and then they both want what the other one has, but they both, you know, they, they, they're sort of stuck there. Now, if you just do ad hoc programming with locks, you're in quite big risk of this. Um, at least with this approach, you can create such a situation if you're careless with your object graph, but because we put it at the object level rather than having a you can lock anywhere you want, um, you know, we, we actually, uh, through this approach, sort of give a lot more structure to your program um, and sort of uh, rule out at least a bunch of the risks. But still, it's, you know, it's possible. An alternative is to keep this one at a time approach, but to say, well, um, instead of handling all of these messages synchronously, we'll handle them asynchronously. Okay, so you tell the object to do something and then you go on and get on with your life. And you don't bother waiting around for it to do the thing you uh, go on and do whatever next thing you need to do. So essentially what you're doing is whenever you call a method on an actor, instead of waiting for that method to actually be run, you just 
shove it into the, the to-do list, if you like, or the queue, um, and you let the actor process it, and that happens off on some thread somewhere. And it enforces the problem that it does, w sorry, the condition that it does one method uh, message process at a time, okay? So one call at a time, but the consumer is not waiting anymore. So imagine that we wanted to have some kind of log where things can just throw things into this log, and we want to, to protect it in some way. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we're only dealing with the state from one thread at a time, but it doesn't make sense for the, the thread to, that uh, wants to put something in there to block on it. Okay, it just wants to send the message, like, you know, shove this stuff in the log, uh, and go and get on with whatever it's doing. So, predictably, I wrote a module. This one's called OO Actors. Okay, and predictably, after you've seen the monitor one, it introduces an actor keyword. Okay, um, so what you're actually doing when you put this there is you're opting into a different set of object semantics. So on the one hand, it looks cute, but on the other hand, you know, this is, this is a very much a sort of Pell 6 design approach. Different things should look different. That's, you know, it, this, this is a very Perl thing in general. It's, it's why plus is always numeric addition and tilde is always concatenation. It's so when you look at the program, you have a good understanding of the semantics from the words it's using. And, uh, you know, here we just make uh, things that are, uh, you know, class-like but with different dispatch semantics uh, actually look different right at the point you declare them. So what I'll have this time is I'll have a hash of uh, events, and uh, remember I declared that enum on the previous slide, severity, okay? What I've actually done is just constrained my hash, so the only uh, keys you can have in that hash are the, uh, the set of enum values. That's a kind of cute thing to, to be able to do, just uh, eliminates a few possible programming errors uh, we might make. <laughs> and when I want to log things, okay, then I just push them into there. And uh, when I want to get the latest entries in the log, um, then uh, you know I get a, a severity level limit, okay? And I just go over the things uh, in the log, and uh, I have the level. Uh, if the level is too low, I skip these things, and otherwise I put all of the messages at that level uh, into my my result list, okay? And I return what I what I found there. So. When I uh, want to log lots of stuff, okay, this will actually just go and you know start throwing lots and lots of things into this log. And this does not block, okay? It goes, it gets on with it. Now, you might then say, well, okay, um, this works really great for the first method there. Because that first method, you know, it, it does some work, it gets on with it, but then I don't have to, um, you know, I, d I don't have to w sort of wait around. But what about this query method here? What do we do for that? Well, when you design objects well, you actually will find, particularly if you follow this, this sort of method first and message first pattern I mentioned, most of your methods are actually command methods that do something and don't return a result. And queries start to become the exception. We call this the tell don't ask principle of object oriented design. We tell objects what to do rather than ask them for what they know and then do stuff based on that. But occasionally, of course, we do need to be able to query. We do need to ask questions. And when we do that, then, uh, you know, if, if this is handled asynchronously, what can we do? Well, the answer is that we hand back a promise. Okay, remember the thing that I talked about earlier, which is an, an object representing a result we will get later. And that means you can do all kinds of stuff like awaiting it, okay? Or, or even, uh, you know, sort of doing time-based stuff with it. Or attaching things that should happen after it's been completed. So we actually start to integrate these, uh, these different sorts of models here. Of course, this is only a very basic implementation and discussion of access. One of the questions you might have been sat there thinking about when I said that the command method doesn't actually, um, you know, um, 
let a, well, we don't sit around waiting for it, okay? Um, one of the things that you might have thought, and this is completely correct, is what happens if for some reason we fail to process the message? And of course, if nothing is waiting for a result, then it's not going to know about the failure. And that's why actors have a system of supervision, where if an actor fails, it sort of passes up to its supervisor the, uh, you know, the, the kind of failure and lets it decide what to do. And you end up with a tree of them. Uh, and uh, this has actually been a very robust model. This is what Erlang is based on, okay? where they, they build very robust systems, uh, despite their motto being, let it crash. It's really great that the, you know one of the things for building the most reliable systems we know, one of the languages that does that has let it crash as a motto. Uh, but the actual realization there is that most crash, most failures are due to you know state corruption or something. So if you just respawn the thing that crashed in the supervisor, then it will be able to to go and get on. And you build a whole little like, tree of these, so things can escalate if they uh, you know they they don't know how to solve something. <laughs> and eventually reach the top of the system and it just sort of says, okay, we'll just restart the whole lot. So actors are a pretty great model. Um, you know, being used very successfully, um, being used in quite a few languages. However, they, they mean that you need to be designing, expecting asynchronous execution. Now, when you have tell, don't ask followed in your object design, you often can get there. But not always. So to finish up, let me consider a final approach. When we write methods that uh, change state in the object, they typically do two things. They check if the change that we're about to make is OK, and then they make the change. OK, so there is some validation to make sure the change won't break any of the business rules or the invariance or whatever we like to call them, and then they mutate the object. And this is a pretty typical method structure. I, it, this actually goes back to what I said about transactionality of methods as well, right? When we call a method, we kind of expect it will either succeed and take the object to a new state, or it will fail and throw an exception and not have changed the object. We just tend to consider that decent design. Um, it's, it does tie into the transactional nature of method calls as well. Okay, I can't actually see that time sign from here, but I hope it said something like five. <laughs> so what we could do instead is we could say, let's do the validation, and let's introduce an event that describes the decision we reached. So if the operation is, you know, can I have this seat on the plane, Either we'll throw out an exception, saying that seat's already taken, or we will actually return an event saying, okay, you can have this seat, okay? The seat was successfully selected. And then we can write a separate method called an application method, which takes this event, pulls the data out, and actually mutates the object. Now you might say, why would we ever want to split the two? What value do we get out of sticking this event in the middle there? What it means is that you can describe the history of a mutable object as a sequence of immutable events. What that means is that you can then, if you ever want to process an operation on the object, you take all of the history, you apply all of it to the object, okay, getting you a fresh object in the current state, and then you process the operation, which will either produce an exception or more events. And what we actually get out of this is an optimistic concurrency model, where things can build up and make their own copy of the object, do their work on it, produce events, or fail, okay? And if they produce events, we then go and persist them. And the, the transaction mechanism on your persistence then is if no else produced events since we loaded up the object, then we are allowed to persist ours, okay? And they're the next thing that happened. Otherwise, we can load it again and retry. So what we're doing here is we're going really down the functional approach, but with objects. So, you know, if I wanted to implement this for plane seats, okay, just to very quickly show you how it might look. 
So I'll have a couple of events. Okay, so the flight was opened, and the seat was selected. And uh, I'll have a couple of exceptions, okay, saying uh, uh, you can't uh, choose this seat because it's out of range, it doesn't exist on the flight, or uh, this seat is already taken. Okay, just a couple of exception classes. And uh, then I've, I've written just a tiny bit of infrastructure for this, okay? And uh, you'll be able to, to grab the code later. I'll point you at where this, uh, this is. But uh, what we have is a, a class here which uh, sort of has the current uh, set of seats that we have taken. And when I want to open a flight, okay, there's no validation. I just produce a flight opened event. When I want to choose a seat, okay, I check that the seat exists, and I check if it's taken, okay, and if none of those is true, then I'm going to yield out this accept this uh, event saying we selected the seat, and then I'll have a couple of these application methods, okay, where I just sort of say. Well, when a flight's opened, just set uh, all of these uh, seat statuses to, to nil. We don't care about them yet. Um, but uh, you know we know they exist in that hash. And uh, whenever we apply a seat selected event, then uh, all we'll do is just uh, just mark that seat as, as uh, now being taken by the passenger with that name. And of course, you know, we then just need a little bit of infrastructure to make this work. We need something that can store these events. That's called an event store. And there's plenty of products on the market that do this. Well, you can build it off on a relational database as well. Okay. What we're doing here is uh, basically we're able to process objects, process uh, events, sorry, on these objects, okay, one at a time. And each time it loads up the history of the object from the events, gives us a fresh scratch object to work on, and then tries to persist as the latest thing, the latest events. Okay. Doing this eventy stuff is really awesome, by the way. Um, this is something I've done a lot of, lot of different clients um, over the last couple of years. Uh, and uh, basically, you, you get some very nice ability to test your objects because you could get them into any state you want without violating their state encapsulation because all of the application is from the events. You get a persistence strategy because you can persist the events very easily. Um, uh, you can distribute them and do publish subscribe. Um, and you get a fairly nice concurrency control model. All of these things that I've just talked about revolve around rethinking the notion of method calls and saying that really we're able to not just sort of treat them like calling a subroutine that happens to live inside of this class, but instead that we're sending a message to an autonomous thing that can decide how it's going to process it. What we've seen is uh, you know, a few different ways that we might approach this. We've seen that the, the monitors and actors approach mostly differ by synchrony and asynchrony on the call. And they both give you that one at a time. And it's in a completely different model here with the events where we build the object up, but we give every processing thread a fresh object built out of the history. That has, that has fairly interesting architectural consequences beyond this. Okay. So hopefully what you've seen there is this, you know, while objects are very staty, there's a whole bunch of ways that we can sort of use them and take this idea of sending a message, change what we do with the messages, and actually get ourselves to some interesting concurrency models for objects. And uh, you know, again, it means you have to think very much about objects in a, you know, as autonomous things where method calls on them are transactions. And once we start getting into that mindset, I think we do much better OO design. But it also means we can apply OO to manage our concurrency problems. I'm pretty sure I've blown up all my time. <laughs> In fact, I, yeah, I, I can pretty certain of that. So um, I don't really think I have time to take questions right now. But um, 
catch me in a break. Okay, I'll be around. Um, I'll take questions then, so I uh, I don't hog the room from the next speaker. Um, also, because I am the next speaker at the uh, Pearl, Chick, Pearl Six tutorial uh, that's about to start taking place upstairs. Um, so if you're looking at all the crazy syntax I've shown you and being like, ah, this looks cool, but I don't understand any of this syntax. Damn it. Okay, then feel free to uh, to join us uh, upstairs at the uh, the tutorial. Other than that, thank you very very much. <laughs>